Well, this morning we are looking at um, Zechariah and making room. Now, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they promise to uh, give us a final chapter in, the, in the Israel's story, in its history. We're looking at how that this chapter in Israel would be continuing. That, you know, if you're looking at the Old Testament and you see how the prophets have foretold the coming of the Messiah, and um, it seems that this would be a, a perfect opportunity for the Old Testament to pick up its um, continued revelation and put it into practice, but instead it becomes the first chapter in the sequel to Israel, which is the church. So these four Gospels tell us the story of Jesus coming and announce that God's long-awaited kingdom has finally arrived. They've been praying, th- seeking, and th- uh, praying, seeking, longing for the kingdom of God to come, for the Messiah to come. And it has been some 400 years since the um, Old Testament, the last prophet had written Micah. And so beginning with Jesus, and well, actually beginning with Zechariah and John the Baptist, as we're going to read here in just a moment, the... Um, the word had, from the Lord had ceased. It hadn't been there for some 400 years. So the nation of Israel, they were waiting and imagining, hoping for the Messiah to come. But the promise, the, the promise that was given, they had a misguided or a wrong perspective of what this Messiah would look like. And so for those who were watching, they saw Jesus coming and they saw how that In Luke's Gospels, he presents to us a picture, a narrative of what happens from the very beginning with Zechariah. And Luke writes on through the the life of Jesus into the book of Acts. He writes the book of Acts. And he tells about the coming of the Holy Spirit and the beginning of the church. and And so Luke puts together what he is saying here as a narrative of the early church and the beginnings. So... He tells us about God becoming man, God being born of a virgin, how that Mary was cast out of her community, um, how that God ends up lying in a feed trough in a stable. And, uh, you know, when we think of stables, you know, I think of a barn and a structure. This probably was more like a cave with perhaps a few uh, wooden things over the top or to extend it out from from the hillside, but it wasn't like a a structure that we would think of as a stable that is a a freestanding barn or whatever. So God, whenever Israel, they did not see him coming, and uh, the incarnation was God's hospitable, his hospitality that he was offering to humankind, that he was welcoming, that he was friendly, that he was open, he was generous. So God was coming in a way that would show people exactly what the character of God was and who he was opening his life to. He welcomes the rebels, the sinners. He welcomes his enemies. (laughs) He welcomes haters and doubters. God has no problem with who people are because God has offered a forgiveness. God has offered a cleansing for what has happened in life. He's offered a way that we can be cleansed from our sins and we have the hope of eternal life that that through Christ we will live forever. So this brings us to an invitation of unreasonable hospitality. (laughs) Um, If you think about Jesus and his coming, he is one who presents the character of God in such a way being born of a a woman marrying a virgin who is a peasant and having to travel to for taxation at the last minute of her pregnancies and and uh, her child is born in bethlehem and uh, and laid in a manger this is unreasonable (laughs) it is an invitation of unreasonable hospitality of unreasonable love that god who created all things would would allow himself, give permission to himself, or come to this very lowly place as the beginning of his ministry, the beginning of his life. His love 
as we see his initial beginnings of, uh, of his coming to this place in Bethlehem, in this manger, he has an unreasonable love. And people have, co- ha- people have stated that his love was irrational. His love is undeserved. In every way, it's over the top. In every way, his love is extravagant because it is presenting and presenting the picture of God coming to man and he is coming in the lowest possible place, <laughs> a stable full of animals and stinks and laid in a manger for his first cradle. Those who don't believe create scandals. But those who do believe receive forgiveness and love. The host of the, for the king of kings is this poor peasant woman giving birth in the stable, this, little, this cave filled with animals. So, king of kings, lord of lords, creator of heaven and earth, the alpha and the omega, the first and the last, he, he who created the world was there at the beginning in creation and spoke the world into existence, comes to, in the form of man, the incarnation, and is born of this obscure peasant woman and placed in a manger in the side of a hill cave, and this is where the king of kings arrives. So Luke begins a narrative. He begins in Luke chapter 1, and we'll be reading sections of, the ver- of this chapter and then talking about them. Luke chapter 1, verse 1, b- reading to verse 4. Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which we have fulfill- fulfilled among us. What happens? To, to write out what somebody, what has happened in the life of Christ. I'm putting together a narrative of Jesus from the very beginning, okay? But we find that he doesn't begin with Jesus. And um, we'll we'll talk about that in a moment. Verse 2, Just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us, it seemed good to me, also having had perfect understanding of all things, from the very first to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things which you were instructed. So these four verses are kind of a, what we call them, um, an historical, for, it was common for Greek historical works to begin with such a prologue. Because this is the introduction to this uh, what he is going to tell us, but Theophilus was a um, is a title which is saying to the most honorable individual. Now, Theophilus meaning he is a he he could be a Roman official, could be a person of high social status, but it was also written in Luke. I'm sure understood that it not only would be written to this high official, but it would be understood by those who would read it later. And it wasn't necessarily written that one person would receive it and that would be the end of it. So this Theophilus then could have been a high official, could have been a person who financed Luke in his writings and in his, in his ministry. Uh, after this formal prologue, uh, Luke shifts into a simple narrative. And we'll, we'll follow that in just a moment. Matthew and Mark most likely were written before Luke. And so when Luke then is talking about his um, expert eyewitnesses, he could have been referring to Matthew and Mark. He could have been uh, referring to those who were around at the time of the birth of Jesus. And he was using this as a word of mouth, but yet historical record as to what happened. Now, it's interesting that Luke, the physician, writes so in-depthly about what happens here and how that he presents the um, message of, of here, John the Baptist and, and John's conception and, and so on and his father, Zechariah, how that all this comes together to, pre- to prepare the way 
for the Messiah. And the important thing is to see how that Luke is not just making up a story. He is telling us a story that is directly connected to the Old Testament. 400 years earlier, it is said one thing, and Luke picks up with that in here in just a moment. So um, Luke was written about 60, 63 uh, A.D., and it was written to the Gentiles. So if you read the Gospel of Matthew, we find that that's written to the Jews, and you have all the lineage. People wanted to know uh, if you were uh, a, a Jewish lineage, you had to know the, the person's lineage as far back as you could in order to be a legitimate uh, Hebrew. Well, here, Luke is writing to the Gentiles to give us an accurate record of what is happening, what has happened. Verse 4 says that you may know the certainty. <laughs> so Luke is saying you can know for sure. You don't have to listen to the tales and stories that people are saying. I'm going to write a narrative. Now, he is claiming, um, he is not claiming that he was an eyewitness, but he is writing at his, with historical accuracy of what took place um, in the verses that are to follow. Verse 5 he gives us the time frame. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abjah, his wife of the daughter of his wife was of the daughter of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous before God, walked in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless, but they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well advanced in years. Now, Herod gives us the time period, and Zacharias um, is a priest name, and it means Jehovah has remembered. So it's interesting because when you think of praying and, and, and prayers not being answered, and in this case, they had been praying for a child and their uh, prayers had not been answered, but there was always this, every time they said Zacharias, Zachariah, you're, you know, husband, wife, wife calling, Zachariah, would you come here? It means Jehovah has remembered. So every time he called him, Jehovah has remembered, come here. <laughs> what is your prayer? Jehovah has remembered. And so, as we look at this, we want to see how, pick up, what is Zacharias, who is he, and how does he refer to, or perhaps even link up with us. Nowhere is it stated in all of this that Zachariah or Elizabeth were praying for a child. It just says that they were old in years and that um, they were without a child. So, it's inferred that they were praying for a child. Now, one of the things that Zechariah and his priesthood, he was in the temple priesthood. There were 24 orders or 24 divisions of priests of the priesthood. And Zechariah was in the division number 8 of the 24. Okay? So the priests were um, of a lineage of Aaron, and they were in charge of taking care of the temple. And they would go, their division would go to the temple two times a year. So that's quite a thing for a preacher. I only have to show up two times a year. Work two weeks a year. What's that? Oh, yeah, Christers. That'd be Christmas and Easter. <laughs> Both of them were righteous uh, before the Lord, meaning that they were believers, that they were justified before God, they had fulfilled the law, they were very uh, conscious of what the law stated. But verse 7 says barren, that Elizabeth was barren and she was well advanced in years. And, was se and this barrenness, though, was seen as a disfavor from God. Because everything was about lineage and children and passing things on. And so it was, you know, it was about your lineage. And so um, who you were going to leave your lineage to, your inheritance, your, your name. Well, Zechariah and Elizabeth had no children, so they could not leave their name. Well, verse 8. <clears throat> so it was that while he was serving as a priest before God in the order of his division, so, okay, he is of the division 8 
you know, I don't know what its official title would have been, but he was of, of the 24 uh, divisions, Division 8, and all the priests that were in Division 8 would be at the temple uh, serving uh, during that time. According, verse 9, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of people were praying outside at, our, at the hour of incense. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. So the order of the division, he was of the order of eight, and his whole division was there. The lot fell upon him, verse 9. It's, uh, you know, one of the, sometimes when we think of life, we think of, oh, the, that it's luck. Certain things happen at certain times. Well, Zechariah and Elizabeth had been praying for years to have a child. Perhaps they'd given up on their prayer. But it was at a specific time that Zechariah was in the temple and that he was there to offer this incense. No one was permitted to do this two times in their lifetime. And there were so many priests that the lots were, sh were, uh, lots were taken and like pulling the name out of the hat. <laughs> and once your name has been called, it doesn't go back in. So Zechariah, his lot was there, lot eight, and then he was chosen from among them to go into the altar and offer this incense unto the Lord. Incense, it was not just for smell and aroma. Incense represented prayers going up to God. So the incense was ever burning uh, as a part of the tabernacle, so that was, represented the prayers of people going to God. And so I think of it as being such a, a turning point that here is the beginning of the Messiah, that, that Jesus is going to come, and how do, you, how do you begin this but by remembering the promise and tying the events back to the Old Testament, bringing them into the New? And we'll do that in a moment here. So the Messiah is coming, and so it is his arrival at the appointed time, the, the time for Zechariah and Elizabeth to have a child had to arrive at a certain port, a certain period of time, which would be six months before the angel would appear to Mary and would tell her about uh, the divine conception that she would have. So divine appointments, divine timing, has a lot to do, has a lot to do with the answer to our prayer and to what God is doing in our life. That's why it's so important not to give up on God in the difficult times or to give up on our prayers because we think they're not answered. That God has a, a lot going on in this whole situation in our life and the answer to our prayer. So uh, the alone priest then would be allowed to go in and offer this incense unto God. Verse 12 offers us a significant insight into what happened. The angel of the Lord appeared before Zechariah. <laughs> Fear fell upon him. So... What would you do? You're at a time of prayer, and the angel of God shows up and says, and gives you a message. Do you think you'd be afraid? <laughs> if you said no, I don't want to talk to you about that. <laughs> because we would be afraid. A divine visitation, a divine visitor shows up, and there he is, and he's giving us a messenger, a message. Verse 13. And the angel said unto him, Do not be afraid. Boom. God always meets us right where we're at. God has a message for Zechariah, and he has to pay attention. <laughs> Don't allow your fear. Don't allow your fear to take over what's going on in your life. So the angel said, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard. But we don't know what the prayer is. We, we don't have Zechariah praying. But we have the description of what the prayer is here in verse 13. Uh, your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. 
For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedience of, to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. What a great announcement. <laughs> Do not be afraid. Um, your prayer is answered. Joy and gladness will be the hall hallmark of the message and of the time before us, before you. Neither will he have strong drink uh, and, or wine because he will have what is called a Nazarite vow, being separated unto God. There were only two others mentioned. Samson and Samuel were of that same category, uh, that they were a uh, Nazarite vow for their entire life. Some people would, would have taken a Nazarite vow for a special period for a specific period of time. So even from his mother's womb, uh, John the Baptist would be this, this John would be the um, individual that would be anointed by the Holy Spirit. But mo this, this important aspect of being filled with the Spirit was, you know, John was, you know, we know later as we jump ahead, we know John was this, he was out in the wilderness and he had the message of repentance and bringing people uh, the message of God. And um, John was known for his bold, uncompromising position and his stand on the word of God. But the, the verses that John, that is quoted by Luke, come from Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. Behold, I will send you. Now, this is the ending of the Old Testament. Uh, and it's 400 years have elapsed since this was written to when John is uh, the angel appears to John in this uh, in the altar of incense. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. <coughs> it would, you know, I often one wondered what that meant. Was that the um, fathers were not teaching their children? the ways of God. <laughs> and so the prophet that is coming will be like Elijah. And this is who, what Luke is writing, and this is, is John the Baptist, will be like John, will be like this prophet Elijah in his ministry and his presentation. So what's happening is Jesus is coming, and the starting of this Revelation or the incarnation has started with John, the revelator. <laughs> Not John the revelator, John the Baptist. So the, this is the Im a very important text here. The next section is, And Zechariah said to the angel, <laughs> You know, what would you say if an angel showed up, gave you a message? How do I know this is true? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> oh God. <laughs> you know, Look at, we'll jump ahead a little and think about Mary. When the angel says, Mary, you're going to have a child, and you're not going to know a man. And she says, behold the handmaiden of the Lord. Zechariah, yeah, the angel says, you're gonna ha your wife is going to have a, have a son, and you're going to call his name John. And he, and he says, how do I know this is going to happen? <laughs> what do you think you would say? <laughs> yeah. Gives you a promise. But you see, we have promises like that in the New Testament in that the Holy Spirit inspires the writers in the, Old, in the New Testament of promises that God will never leave us nor forsake us. If we feel abandoned, uh, you know, we have a promise. Well, how do I know that this is going to happen? Well, the Holy Spirit is helping us to understand that. So Zechariah said, how shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife is well advanced in years. Well, it's similar to what happens in Genesis with Abraham. Uh, in Genesis 15, it says, The Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit, inherit this? So Abraham's asking God the same thing. God told him, and he says, How do I know this is going to happen? So he said unto him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer and three-year-old female goat and three-year-old three ram. And what he does is he cuts them in half, 
and he, the, he separates the animals, one on one side and one on the other. And whenever they are making a covenant or agreement, the two are to walk through the middle of those animals, and that a walking through there together is saying, if I fail to keep this covenant, may the same thing happen to me, divided, cut in half. <laughs> so that's a covenant. But God, to Abraham, says, Abraham, you stand there. You st he's in a dream and whatever. He says, you stay there, and God walks through the midst of those animals, saying that he is establishing a covenant with Israel. You see, when God promises to forgive us of our sins, he is saying, I've already taken care of that. I've already come and died for your sins. I've already come and purchased your salvation with my death and resurrection. And the fulfillment of the covenant, I have, I have fulfilled it. I have died for your sin. Now you are responsible to take up what I have done for you. Then we have verse uh, 19 and 20. And the angel answered and said unto him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God. <laughs> I wonder if he's insulted. No, and I'm reading into this. Um, Gabriel is like, there's two, there's two angels mentioned in the Bible. Gabriel and Michael. And this guy is, <laughs> this angel is one of the most important and powerful angels in heaven. And Zechariah says, how do I know what you're saying is true? <laughs> it's like, okay, uh, you want to know? If, you, if, if an angel comes to you and says, blessings of God and the word of God, you only, now remember this, You'll never receive a, a information from God that doesn't matter, does not make, you will never receive information from God that contradicts what's already written in the scriptures, okay? The scriptures are our foundation. There are no new revelations. There's only the revelation of what is already written, and it may be new to you, but it is still written. So, the angel says to, um, <laughs> I stand in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you to bring you peace. I was sent here to bring you peace that what you've been praying for will happen. Glad tidings, verse 20. But, <laughs> when God or the angel puts a little but in there, uh, behold, you will be mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place. Because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. Zechariah receives the answer to his prayer. How shall I know this? <laughs> his request. And um, it's quite a... Do you, think that was a uh, do you think that was a good idea to keep him mute? <laughs> I don't know. We'll go on. And the prophet and the people waited for Zechariah and marveled that he lingered so long in the temple. So, there, you know, this was this room that where the, he was offering this incense. There was not a crowd of people in there. It was, just, it was just Zechariah. And he was appointed and he goes in there to offer the incense on the altar. And this incense was uh, done morning and evening. Uh, and so it was Zechariah's time. And then they would go in, put the incense, and, and then they would come out and pronounce a blessing on all the people who were praying as he was in there. So, uh, and they waited for Zechariah, and they marveled, he doesn't co he's not coming. What happened? What's going on? But when he came out, he could not speak to them, and they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned to them and remained speechless. <laughs> so, they marveled that he lingered so long, and um, it was only supposed to be you know, the offering of the incense, you do your thing and walk back out. But the conversation with the angel and the declaration that went on took more time than normal. Verse 23. So it was as soon as the days of the service were completed, the days of the service, so they had to serve at the temple for a certain period of time, maybe it's a week or something, and they served at the temple, and then after their service was done, he would go home. And he departed to his own house, and after those days, his wife Elizabeth. So Elizabeth 
probably has heard by via the you know internet and uh, texting. Uh, she's probably heard that her husband has uh, seen a vision, and no, he can't tell what it is. <laughs> so somehow he conveys. You know, can you imagine if if uh, if, uh, guy, if wives if your husband came home and was speechless? What would you say? <laughs> it's a miracle. <laughs> what have you done? <laughs> Well, in this case, um, Elizabeth uh, is understanding, she conceives, and she hid herself for five months. What was going on is it was such a disgrace and a disfavor of God if a woman could not have a child. So that's what people conceived, what people perceived it to be, that you've done something wrong and God is punishing you by not giving you a child. And so Elizabeth hid herself for five months <laughs> so that it was, you know, people had heard, but they hadn't seen her. But her, her staying away was one of two things. One was that it was her devotion to God and thanking God for what, what has happened for her to have a child. And also it was her service or her prayers or her admiration of God that kept her in seclusion. Thus the Lord has dealt with me. So God has dealt with me. But the people would have thought she had sinned, and that's why it was, but, and God was dealing with her in the sense that she didn't have a child. But now she's having a child, and she's saying, God is dealing with me. God is blessing me, and his favor is on my life. In the, in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach, my disgrace among the people, that I, my disgrace is removed from the people. They no longer can call me um, that God is against me because of some sin. God's grace is shown to me because I am having a child. How do you see yourself in the characters of the story? In Elizabeth, in Zechariah, in the answering of prayers, unanswering of prayers, not answered prayers, we see ourselves, you know, <laughs> passing judgment like the crowd upon Elizabeth and saying, well, she doesn't have a child, God's against her, she's done some sin. Or Zachariah spending too much time or doubting, doubting the angel's word. So each of these things has, a, has an important message for us to be reflective of. And in the weeks and days that are coming in this, you know, preparing for Christmas and the birth of Christ, and we're, looking at, we're, we're examining ourselves and seeing how do, we, how do we fit into these characters, Elizabeth, Zacharias, listening for the message from the angel, listening for the promise of God that is given to us by the Holy Spirit. And, and I'll kind of jump ahead, but when John the Baptist, when, when Elizabeth the angel tells Mary, your cousin Elizabeth is with child. And so Mary leaves and goes to be with Elizabeth. And when she greets Elizabeth, John is filled with the Spirit and leaps in her womb. And from, her very, from John's very birth, he is a man filled with the Spirit of God. And Jesus even says, there is never a man born among women as great as John the Baptist. So what is taking place here is uh, one of the great events of, of all time, but not greater than the birth of Christ. So here are the players in this. These are the individuals in this scenario. How do we see this playing out in their lives? We know how it comes out, but how does it play out in our lives? And how do we <laughs> make room for God to do for God to speak to our hearts and lives? That's the answer. <laughs> that's the answer. That's okay. <laughs> the answer, that's the answer. God rings. <laughs> God rings in. Jesus, we thank you for hearing our prayers for your word that speaks to our hearts and lives. God, we don't understand all the things that happen in life, but we do know that we trust you. And that, God, that you are with us and you will never leave us. So we ask for your blessing and your strength and your help and your guidance and all these things. And in this 
time of preparation for this Advent that we prepare for the coming of our Savior. We pray for your guidance in our studies and in our word and our prayers. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.